please give a warm welcome to the host of Broadway Buzz, <laughs> Mr. Joe Gary. Thank you very much, and Happy New Year to all of you, and welcome to Broadway Buzz, and welcome to Mrs. Doubtfire. You know, we say in the theater that timing is everything. Uh, you know, we live in such a toxic environment right now, and two wars uh, happening in the world that are devastating and uh, upsetting to the entire world. And then finally, we have this good, old-fashioned Broadway musical comedy, Mrs. Doubtfire. And as they say, it is a surefire hit. Uh, Rob McClure, who's the star of this show, uh, played the role on Broadway. It is very unusual for a Broadway leading man to lead a national tour, and lucky for us that he is, because it's an extraordinary and sort of groundbreaking performance. Uh, he came to to the attention of New York. He's been in many shows in New York. You've seen him in many touring shows, so read his bio. But in any case, uh, he would do a production of Chaplin, the musical on Broadway. It wasn't especially well received, but his performance was a definitive star-making performance. He is one of the great comedic actors working in the musical theater, and we're so lucky to have him here in this show. The irony is also his wife is playing his wife in the show, and it is a story about divorce, so he very happily says, I get divorced eight times a week. <laughs> And his little five-year-old girl is traveling with him, and all of the children in the show uh, have adopted her. So it's a perfect family uh, environment. Okay, so let us go to the beginning of all of this. We're dealing with a novel, a film, and the musical. The novel was written in 1987 by Anne Fine. It's a name I'd like you to remember. She's an English writer. Uh, she has been given every possible award in literature in England. Uh, she's been uh, honored by the Queen. She's received an OBE award in England. And her work is extraordinary. She's written 70 novels for children. And for years, uh, I have been giving books to young people when we get so tired of the same American authors over and over. Uh, look into Anne Fine because she writes wonderful and compelling books. When she wrote Madame Doubtfire, it's been variously called in England, it was called uh, the alias Madame Doubtfire. In America, it was called uh, Madame Doubtfire. But it is the story that we will see developed both in the play, in the movie, and in the musical uh, of a father who's going through a divorce who's not being given custody of his children, a man who loves his children more than anything. Uh, he's an unemployed actor. Uh, his wife is very aggressive and successful. And so she hires a nanny to look after the children. And of course, it dawns on uh, our actor to become the nanny, and he becomes Mrs. Doubtfire. And what results is an incredibly delightful, warm, and touching story. Uh, it, this, in the novel form, it functions on so many levels. I mean, it's an English novel, and it's so British, uh, you can smell the tea being made in the kitchen, uh, but it is a great delight. Uh, but the father in this case is an unemployed actor. You know famously uh, from the movie uh, that, the, that the actor in the film is a voiceover actor, and it, it tapped into all of Robin Williams' great talents as a mimic, uh, and so they, shape, they reshaped the whole story to suit his talents. But in the original story, which is really quite delightful, 
title. Uh, the actor uh, hires himself out as a nude model for elderly ladies taking art classes. And so while that's quite delightful, it'd be a little difficult to pull off in a musical. So in any case, it is the frame of the novel, but the real frame of the novel uh, is about children dealing with divorce. And so while the novel is very funny, it's very satiric, it's very biting, it's very cutting edge, it's really a delightful work. Uh, but on another level then, it shows the real power of the agony of what families go through in divorce. So it's a wonderful tale, beautifully told uh, in its novel form. So ironically, the novel came out, as I told you, in 1986. Uh, the other interesting point was the uh, Anne Fine uh, started her career like five years earlier, and she wrote a, a novel and sent it to everyone. It was rejected by everyone. She kept it under her bed for five years, and finally her husband said, either throw it out or put it back into circulation. And she sent the original novel out, and it was accepted, and then she went on to have this really stunning career of, you know, 70 major novels that have all been honored in special ways uh, in England. So perseverance is very important, of course, in the arts. Okay, so in 1993, then, it's optioned to be turned into a film. Uh, she wanted Warren Beatty to play the lead, and Hollywood had a different idea. They knew that it was going to be a vehicle for Robin Williams, and so they changed uh, uh, substantially, the storyline is the same, but they changed location and changed idiom and changed atmosphere. So they moved it. First of all, they were going to set it in Chicago, and Robin Williams was very insistent that it wasn't a quirky enough environment, and so he talked them into settling on San Francisco. And so, as you remember, if you love that film, and if you haven't seen it, I really recommend uh, you know, you watch it on Netflix sometime soon. It's a groundbreaking, brilliant performance uh, for Robin Williams. But again, the environment, filming in San Francisco is so important because the film is a love letter to San Francisco. Uh, ironically, uh, when Robin Williams died uh, as a suicide victim, uh, they, the world decided that his memorial would be the house that was used in the movie of, of, the, of the film, Mrs. Doubtfire. And so the house on Steiner Street uh, became the sort of memorial, and people left flowers on the steps, letters on the steps, gifts on the steps, uh, honoring the brilliance of Robin Williams. When they made that film, he had to be in makeup four hours every day before the work started. And Robin Williams, to make certain that the makeup was real and authentic, decided to go out and walk on the streets in San Francisco. And no one paid any attention to him. But then we have to remember, it was San Francisco, right? <laughs> so in any case, uh, he, he really pushed the button too far, however, when he went into a sex shop uh, and looked at various uh, unspoken items in the sex shop. And then finally, the people in the store recognized him as Robin Williams. But it took a very long time to push that disguise. So it worked brilliantly. And the other thing I want you to remember about the movie and about the brilliance of, of Robin Williams' performance uh, is that not only was it a great comedic performance, but under it, there's this tremendous sensitivity. I mean, we remember uh, in, in other movies that he, that he made, like Dead Poets Society, for example, where he plays this sort of down and out character, uh, this sort of shabby puppy dog approach that Robin Williams used in his performance that would make the work so dimensional and so touching. Uh, remember, Sally Fields played his wife in the movie, and the, the screenwriters really didn't help her a great deal with that role. It's an unsympathetic 
enthrall because we immediately love the character that Robin Williams is playing and his love for his children. So it's very difficult to play the heavy in that story. But Sally Fields is very good and very smart actress. And she found levels of playing it that made us understand that she too was really trying to protect her children and ultimately trying to protect herself. So it's a monumental film. It was made for $22 million. It made $441 million. It was the second largest grossing film in 1993 with Jurassic Park beating it out. But it stands as one of the great comic performances and film. Okay, so this creates a very big problem for the musical because, you know, millions of people all over the world have seen Mrs. Doubtfire, and for them, Robin Williams is Mrs. Doubtfire. So how are you going to put together a script uh, that's going to have the same dimension, the same power, the same wit uh, as the film, and then also having the same pathos, the same insight, the same dimension that the novel had. So uh, let us look then at the making of this musical. And let me introduce Kevin McCollum, who is the producer of this show. Uh, many of you know his work, of course. He would win the Tony Award for Rent, for Avenue Q. Uh, he's had large numbers uh, in the Heights, large numbers of great successes. He's been a major force in the Broadway musical for 25 years. He signed a deal with 20th Century Fox that he would take 12 of their most important commercial films and turn them into musicals. And right now, this month, you watch what happens in New York. He has two of those films that he's adapted as musicals. Uh, one is The Days of Wine and Roses, and the other is The Notebook, and they're both opening in New York this month. So Mrs. Doubtfire was in that same category. It was one of those 12 films uh, that he adapted for Broadway. When it opened, first of all, in uh, 2019, uh, it opened in Seattle. Well, even before that, let me just tell you about how a producer has to keep uh, adjusting to the times. He originally announced that Alan Menken, the great composer uh, who did all the great Disney films, was going to be writing the music, and that Harvey Firestein was going to be writing the lyrics. As you remember, Harvey Firestein played the gay brother in the movie Mrs. Doubtfire, and he's had tremendous success on Broadway also. So this is a really star-making team. Uh, but however, Alan Menken was ill in this period and had to withdraw from the project taking away a lot of the luster and excitement about the idea of the developing of Mrs. Doubtfire. He then put together really an extraordinary group of people. And let me just talk about this for you. He hired then Carrie and Wayne Kirkpatrick to write the music and lyrics. Uh, they achieved great success in New York with the musical Something Rotten. That show played here. It's a delightful show. It's an Elizabethan romp. Shakespeare is a character in it. It's a very offbeat, very original musical with spectacular music and very satiric lyrics. Uh, so th these two men had a very interesting background. They're brothers. They were born in a very religious family in Louisiana. Uh, they both escaped the, you know, the heavy religious indoctrination of their lives. Uh, Wayne Kirkpatrick went to Nashville, where he became a major writer of hit songs for many of the, you know, Nashville divas. And then uh, 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 Carrie Kirkpatrick went to Hollywood, where he worked for the Disney organization and worked as a producer and screenwriter. So both of them had very successful careers. But when they came together uh, to do something rotten, we realized that that was a sort of incomparable team, that the lyrics were as clever as the music, uh, and it played wonderfully. So they were put together as the team to write.
write the music for this show. And of course, the line that we always have to use is, how do you make the story sing? I want you to watch very carefully how this show has been constructed. You know, we talk early on about the idea of a play is really put together by a series of scenes, and we call them French scenes, which means any regrouping of characters. So watch how cleverly each of the characters in the show will be given a very strong character song so you know what the character wants. We first meet the wife, Miranda, and Miranda tells us that she really has to protect her children. She really can't live anymore with this uh, husband who's really more like a child than he is husband, uh, and she has to find a way of protecting her family. Watch the series of songs that she sings. They're very touching songs, wonderfully developed. You understand why all the leading ladies of Nashville love to have Wayne Kirkpatrick write music for them. Watch the touching ballads that she's given through the show. And then, of course, we have the father, uh, Daniel, and watch the progression of songs he has. Uh, and, you know, we see very early on his when he goes to court begging to have custody of his children, and we realize uh, how devoted he is as as a father and how oblivious he is really as a husband. But watch this progression of songs that they've given these two characters, and then watch how these characters are matched with other people singing. Uh, watch uh, Daniel, the father, singing with his eldest daughter. Uh, at the end of the show, uh, right before the climax of the show, there is one of the most touching songs in the show, uh, and it's a really beautiful ballad once again. Uh, and we see the skill that these writers have in telling the story, making the story sing, and they do that very successfully. Okay, so then let me go on with the group of people that were hired. John O'Farrell was hired to be one of the book writers, and then also they used Casey Kirkpatrick to write the book, so they had to adapt uh, from the film and from the novel. Basically, they use the, the writing from the film score in that it will be based in San Francisco, in that the actor is, does do voiceovers, uh, and so it follows that storyline. But in terms of the pathos, and the emotion and the family story that's told, they really rely heavily on the original novel. So they're very skilled. And, and John O'Farrell, as a writer, you may know, he's an English writer. He's known as a novelist, a best-selling novelist in England. Probably his most successful and funniest book is a book that's called The Man Who Lost His Wife. Uh, and he's also a political writer, so he's very su equally successful in nonfiction uh, and selling best-selling works uh, in England. So John O'Farrell is sort of perfect uh, to make this show very contemporary. Remember, it was written in 1987. Values were very different in 1987. And when it was presented as a film in 1993, values, again, have changed very significantly from that period to the present. So it is John O'Farrell who really helped sensitize the book uh, so that it's pertinent. And he redefines the sense of family. Uh, watch in the story that we have here uh, Daniel's brother uh, is gay and is in a relationship, uh, and they ultimately will adopt a child. So again, family is redefined, uh, really, in this story, and wonderfully done uh, in the process. And then the coup to all of this, as the producer is putting this team together, he hires Jerry Zachs. Uh, who is one of Broadway's great directors. Uh, Jerry Zachs had a career as an actor, uh, but primarily he's known as a director. And again, he's been so prolific in the last 25 years in New York. Take the opportunity of reading his bio. You will recognize countless shows. But early on, what drew attention to Jerry Zachs uh, was he, he ran Lincoln Center in New York, uh, and he would bring to light some a very, very 
very interesting comedies like Six Degrees of Separation and many of Christopher Durang's early very dark comedies. So he's had, Jerry Zachs has had this long history of working with very complex comedy, which we're going to be talking about in the way this show is created. Okay, so the show then starts in 2019. It previews in Seattle. It has rave reviews. It's extended. The word of mouth is great. It moves to Broadway. In the first three rehearsals, uh, or the first three uh, performances on Broadway, standing ovations and uh, extended curtain calls, and then COVID happened. And so it closed down for 18 months. Uh, and the producer worked very hard to keep the company together. And when he reopened 18 months later, uh, another version of COVID had happened. So it was devastating to the show. It was meant to be a family show. And children had to show all kinds of credentials that they had had, immunization shots, etc. So it was still in a period where the, all those shots had not been available to young people. So it was a very difficult time. The show only played on Broadway for 83 performances, but this does not mean that it is not a wildly successful play. Kevin McCollum again then moved the show to Manchester, England, uh, where it opened to rave reviews, and subsequently it has moved to the West End, where it's playing to capacity audiences and is a big hit in London. So in lieu of trying to reopen it again on Broadway, he decided to take it on tour, which was a very smart decision. And in the process, they also worked very hard on tightening the show and on shaping the music uh, in, in a way that really makes every song really count. Let me for a moment remind you of the ranges of comedy that are in this show. Uh, there's farce and burlesque, there's domestic comedy, and there's high comedy. All of these terms were defined by Aristotle literally 2,500 years ago uh, in his work The Poetics, and they were first demonstrated by the great comic playwright in, in Greece in the period, uh, Aristophanes. And so this idea of presenting a comedy that had so many different levels of comedy. So the idea of farce and burlesque, burlesque basically means a dirty joke, something smutty. Uh, and in the Greek culture and in the ancient Greek theaters, uh, they would have these little playlets between the acts of plays, uh, and they were called satyr plays. And very often they were highly phallic in nature, so therefore very bawdy, but very funny. So that tradition, you know, we remember, we, we use the idea of vaudeville and early burlesque, literally meaning striptease in the American culture, and we would have in those early days in burlesque, the stand-up comics who would tell blue jokes, dirty jokes. It's how George Burns and Gracie Allen started. It's how the Three Stooges started uh, with sort of bawdy, low humor. There's a little of that in this show, but primarily there's an enormous amount of farce. Farce, as you know, means we laugh at something because it's visually funny, because it's physical. So in other words, uh, what Aristophanes was saying that you can deal with comedy in a very intellectual way, as in the case of satire. You can deal with it in terms of everyday ordinary life, as in domestic comedy. Almost everything we watch on television, uh, Friends, Frasier, uh, these are all examples of domestic comedy. And then farce is based on visual, physical humor. This is probably the hardest humor to make work. Uh, we remember from our silent movies the Keystone Cops, uh, and you know we remember watching those little silent films where you see him directing traffic, and then he's run over by a car and he gets back up and we laugh, and then he's run over by a truck, he gets back up and we laugh, then he's run over by a steamroller and he's flat, and we really laugh. This idea of very bizarre, very dark, very questionable humor is the basis of farce. And again, it can be as visual as you remembering I Love Lucy with Lucy doing all of her mugging and all of her visual takes, uh, or Carol Burnett doing the same thing. Uh, so 
The farce has been probably the most difficult but most appealing kind of humor we have. And I want you to pay attention to two major farce scenes in this show. Uh, so keep in mind, at the very beginning, we know this story is about a man who wants to keep his children. He doesn't want to just see them in a supervised way once a week uh, with court supervision. So he becomes the nanny that his wife is applying for. So it is a story about drag, of course. And remember, drag is an ancient tradition. Uh, it, it was used in the classical Greek theory theater, all the roles were played by men. So uh, there was cross-dressing in the Greek theater. There was cross-dressing in Shakespeare, uh, all the great young roles, the Rosalind and all those beautiful and romantic roles from the comedies uh, and Juliet were all played by young men in drag. Uh, cross-dressing. And so it's an ancient form, and we bring it right up, you know, in the 19th century, uh, we have English Music Hall, and as you know, every year in England, one of the great English actors like Ian McKellen will down drag for a Christmas pantomime for the children of England. So it's a long and ancient tradition that we've had, and it's used to great comic effect here. But what I want to remind you of is this is really about simply disguise. And that's what makes it funny, that a man is in women's clothes in this case. Uh, and one of the things that's so brilliant in this show is watch how the writers deal with this. We remember in the movie uh, when we see uh, Robin Williams uh, as Daniel, in the next frame we see him as Mrs. Doubtfire. We know that he has been in makeup for four hours to make this happen. Happen. But what happens in the theater is really extraordinary. Uh, the actor playing Mrs. Doubtfire has 32 costume changes. Uh, he has one as long as a minute and a half and one as short as 18 seconds. And in most cases, you literally see him backstage that there's a scrim and you see through the wall and you're seeing him changing right in front of your eyes. And the transformation has to be extraordinary because remember, he has to be able to fool his wife and children. And watch how we see this happen the first time. The first time we see Mrs. Doubtfire, watch how it is set up. It's very clever writing, it's very clever direction, uh, and it's very clever performance uh, on the part of the actor playing the role. So watch how this happens. Uh, it happens almost 25 minutes into the show. We go to see Mrs. Doubtfire, knowing that this is about drag, and yet it takes 25 minutes to get there. Uh, and so we have watched those early scenes, see how beautifully they're written. They're written more like a film script than they are like a script for a musical. The show never stops. You keep moving from being in a psychologist's office to being in court to being uh, in Daniel's sleazy little apartment he's had to move into. All these constant transformations are happening in front of our eyes, and it's all done in a very facile way, very clever writing uh, to set all this up, giving us key characters, songs, etc. But finally, we get to that moment when Daniel says, uh, Mrs. his wife says, I will interview you. He's talking to her on the telephone. He has his voice on as Mrs. Doubtfire. She's a Scottish mat matron who is quite formidable. And so she agrees to meet him the next day. So within 24 hours, he has to visually become Mrs. Doubtfire. He goes to uh, his brother, who's a makeup artist, and watch that song that's called Make Me a Woman. It's a very funny song, and it includes Princess Diana, Jackie Onassis, uh, uh, you know, a wide range of every famous woman we uh, ever heard of, uh, and uh, it's a delightful farcical scene. Uh, and then we have the revelation of seeing Mrs. Doubtfire. But the two farcical scenes I want you to be aware of, one is in the first act, and the social worker comes to Daniel's apartment 
uh, and his, she discovers that Mrs. Doubtfire is there. So Daniel now is going to have to play himself, Daniel, and Mrs. Doubtfire. Watch that scene. It's a perfect example of farce. Uh, you know, we say in farce, farce is always about doors slamming, people making entrances and exits, things happening very quickly on stage. Watch how brilliantly that is staged. Watch how brilliantly it is written. Watch how brilliantly it is performed. And literally, right in front of your eyes, you will see the actor transforming uh, from Daniel into Mrs. Doubtfire and back. It's a spectacular and very clever scene, only to be topped in the second act by a scene in a Spanish restaurant. And that is extraordinary. And that's when everything is the ultimate form of visual farce. And again, the great skill of the staging, the great skill of all of the performers playing the material. You, you know that in comedy, we have to believe the people. We can't think if the actors are saying this is nonsense and nothing can happen, they have to really believe in it and invest in it, and they do. And it's really quite spectacular to watch. So what you're seeing is a show that has every range of comedy wonderfully executed, and especially by the leading actor who really is giving a star-making performance in this national tour. Uh, and, uh, you know, he deserves all of the credit uh, that, that he's receiving for this show. Uh, and you're in for a great treat, and you will never think that it's a drag. So <laughs> please enjoy. Thank you.